Well, tala falava and good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Goodfellow Unit webinar on the Female Hormone Odyssey. I am Dr. Hazel Fuyava. I'm a GP in South Auckland and I also work for the Goodfellow Unit and I'm hosting tonight's webinar. We are very lucky to have Dr. Nikki Kay with us tonight. So Nikki is an honorary clinical lecturer in the Division of Medicine at the University College in London. She lectures and researches in the areas of exercise endocrinology with publications in this field. Nikki's clinical endocrine work is mainly with active women, exercises, dancers, athletes, and a focus on relative energy deficiency in sport or reds, and navigating perimenopause and menopause as well. Nikki works to provide a more personalized approach for female, female hormone health. She is a medical advisor to the Scottish Ballet and is a keen dancer herself. Cool. So thank you. Um, thank you, Nikki. I will hand over to you now. Thanks so much, um, Hazel, for that kind introduction. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was recently uh, in New Zealand uh, visiting my son who's doing his PhD at Auckland University. So um, I know New Zealand is a wonderful country and I definitely want to come back soon. Um, so Hazel's already explained that I'm a medical doctor working um, here in the UK at uh, UCL. Um, and I've got a particular interest. In fact, my passion is hormones. And hopefully I'm going to draw you into that and, and persuade you that hormones are amazing, especially when it comes to the hormone of the female hormone odyssey that every woman will experience during her lifetime. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to sort of go it, through it almost in chronological order. I'm going to give you a little introduction um, about hormones. Uh, why are they so vital? and for both our health and our performance, and then sort of go walk through what the female um, hormone odyssey looks like uh, for, uh, for any woman. So starting off with hormones. Hormones are internal chemical messengers that are transmitted throughout the body in the bloodstream. That's brilliant being in the bloodstream because obviously a hormone, this chemical uh, messenger, has access to every single cell in the body. But that doesn't really tell you what does a hormone actually do. And the clue comes from the derivation of the word hormone from ancient Greek, meaning setting in motion. And that precisely describes the mechanism of action of a hormone. When a hormone arrives at a cell, it enters the cell by various means, uh, and it goes directly to the cell nucleus where the DNA resides, and it directs the expression of these genes to make specific proteins. So that is really incredible if you think about it. We are all familiar, I think, with the concept that DNA that holds the blueprint for life, but how does that blueprint actually get translated into, into your body and, and what your body uh, does? And the answer comes in these amazing uh, hormones, a whole array of them. They don't work, of course, individually. There's a whole network. They're talking to each other. And, and as we're going to go on and see that they change a lot, especially in, in a woman um, throughout her life. So... Hormones really set us in motion or set our path for determining our health, um, both in terms of physical and mental health, I want to stress there, because of course, hormones have access to every single cell in the body, and that includes the brain. So these hormones are absolutely crucial and fundamental to understanding uh, what it determines our health, and also will come on to, therefore, what we can do maybe to harness our hormones. Because the good news is, um, you can ha you can indeed harness your hormones uh, to optimize your health through your choice of lifestyle behaviors. So these are I put these in sort of three categories. Um, there's exercise, there's nutrition, and there's sleep. And it is the combination of three, these three behaviors uh, that uh, enable us to harness our hormones and reach our personal uh, optimal health and uh, full potential performance. Um, and reflecting on that, this is not a new concept. I wish I could claim it for myself, but actually um, I have to credit Hippocrates. 2000 years ago, he said, if we could give every individual just the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the sure, safest way to health. So I think that is really um, a fascinating statement. Of course, at the time, 2000 years ago, he didn't realize why this was the case. But of course, now we know that missing link are, are the hormones uh, which connect um, our behaviors, what we do on the outside, if you will, the external to our health internally. 
So, um, as I say, as relevant today as it was uh, 2000 uh, year, years ago. And certainly I work a lot, as mentioned, uh, as Hazel mentioned, I work with uh, dancers and athletes. Uh, I'm a dancer myself. And actually, when I was visiting um, New Zealand, I had the uh, amazing opportunity uh, and honour to uh, discuss with New Zealand Royal Ballet and their school, um, you know, about this concept that uh, we can harness our hormones to not only be healthy, but to perform to our best. So I also spoke to New Zealand High Performance Sport, and we know um, whatever level of exercise we're doing, whether we're elite and professional or we're just amateur like me, then actually what is it that drives those adaptations to, to exercise, to exercise training? And the answer comes in the form of the hormones. So you don't actually get fitter when you're doing the exercise. It's actually in the recovery time when you're asleep, the other crucial ingredient for harnessing your hormones. The hormones drive these positive adaptations across um, all aspects of, of the body function. You can see here I've listed some of the more obvious, I suppose you could say, physical um, effects of, of exercise training in terms of muscular strength and endurance, body composition, bone, metabolism, cardiovascular health, but also notice, um, you know, cognitive function is improved and also mood psychologically. So this is all now fitting together, I think you'll see um, why hormones are so key in determining health and performance. Out of all the hormone systems in the body, uh, I would definitely argue that this hormone network, the intricate choreography of the female hormones that occurs every single menstrual cycle during a woman's life. Um, this is definitely uh, is the most amazing, beautiful, complex. Um, and yes, it is uh, challenging in the sense that because it is complicated, um, often, uh, you know, as we know, females have maybe ex been excluded to a certain extent from research because, because of this beautiful complexity in a way. Um, and the other thing about the interplay of these hormones during the menstrual cycle is that every woman will be subtly different. So each woman will have a slight variation on this theme in terms of the timing of when these uh, hormone peaks and troughs occur, in terms of the level of the hormones and crucially her personal individual biological response to these hormones. Two women can have exactly the same level of progesterone, one will say she feels fine. The other might say, no, she's suffering with some premenstrual uh, symptoms. So this is why um, the menstrual cycle is both uh, beautiful and challenging, I would say. Um, and also just to highlight to you that um, Horme was the goddess of effort, energy and action. So I would encourage that if as a woman you're ever sort of uh, it's muttered that, oh, you're very hormonal, I would encourage you to take this as a compliment because you are being compared to a goddess of effort, energy and action. So for women uh, talking about hormones, we have to, of course, look in a little bit more detail about this particular pattern that we see during uh, the menstrual cycle. Um, Although I've drawn this or represented the fluctuation of these hormones as this very beautiful symmetrical thing, that's just for that's just because it's uh, kind of easier to draw it that way. But uh, in reality, there's quite a lot of variation. In particular, the variation occurs in the follicular phase, and we're just about to publish paper to to demonstrate that on some women who uh, poor things did have blood tests taken every single day of their cycle, and we found that that's where the most variation happens. Whereas if ovulation occurs, then that's more of a a fixed sort of time and a set pattern if ovulation occurs uh, and the luteal phase. So I want to also emphasize that the menstrual cycle and the fluctuation, the, ho the hormones therein, not only is it beautiful, but it is normal physiology. And every woman of reproductive age from the age of her period starting at Menedke to the time when they stop at menopause uh, should be expected to have reasonably regular menstrual cycles. Um, unfortunately, I still get some dancers and athletes who come to me and say they've been told that it's normal for their periods to stop because they are exercising a lot. And I'm here to remind you that actually, regardless of how much exercise you do, you sh uh, these menstrual cycles um, and having regular menstruation, actually, that's a it's a free monthly medical check. And it's a barometer of internal healthy hormones. And actually, athletes and dancers that I work with, I really encourage them to, to track their menstrual cycle because it's actually part of, it's a vital training metric. And you can make sure that you are having uh, reg regular cycles uh, 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 and you're maybe 
uh, if you have irregular cycles, this could indicate an imbalance in between training and nutrition, which I'll mention, uh, go into a little bit more detail shortly. So just some facts and figures, as it were, about the menstrual cycle, age of menarche, uh, is defined as when age you start periods, typically the average age is 12. I find it is a little bit later, a couple of years later in, um, you know, active, uh, active youngsters, dancers, athletes, etc. But there is a hard cut of 15 years. If periods have not started by the age of 15 years, this is primary amenorrhea and warrants medical investigation. Once the cycle starts, then as you are probably aware, the cycle length, the time between the start of one period and the start of the next can be anything from 22 to 35 days. Again, I get a lot of uh, individuals, uh, athletes, dancers coming to me saying, well, I'm worried, oh, I thought I was meant to have exactly a 28 day cycle. By the way, the average in any case is 29, but there can be, there's this variation, even from cycle to cycle, uh, that's absolutely fine. However, if the uh, woman is experiencing fewer than nine periods per year, this is called oligomenorrhea, and requires investigation. And similarly, if the periods stop in a previously regular menstruating woman for more, three months or more, this is secondary amenorrhea, and again, warrants investigation. Uh, and then at the end of this uh, female hormone odyssey, at menopause, uh, periods stop, average age is 51. We'll talk a little bit more about menopause in a minute. So what is so good about these female hormones? Why I am, am I emphasizing the menstrual cycle and the fluctuations of the hormones? Um, to you because these sex steroid hormones released by the ovaries, uh, namely estrogen and progesterone, these are really important for so many uh, facets of, of health. Um, but I've sort of focused on these particular areas. Um, these hormones are super important for bone and soft tissue health. We have evidence from studies that in those um, athletes whose periods stop, they're at far higher risk of bone stress injuries and soft tissue injury, uh, interestingly. Uh, these hormones are very important for cardiovascular health. The main cause of death um, in women post-menopause is actually cardiovascular disease, not breast cancer. And this is because these hormones are very important for maintaining a healthy lipid profile and the reactivity of the endothel endothelium, the lining of the artery walls. These hormones, sex steroid hormones, also important in terms of neurological function, of course, mood we know, uh, and also Anna Mellon and her colleagues in Denmark, very interesting study where they found that amenorrheic athletes had a slower reaction time and lower peak power production. So um, these hormones are very important uh, in directing the response to exercise. Oh, incidentally, these hormones up here, these are the steroid rings you can see. So that's estradiol, the most active form of estrogen, and that's progesterone. You can see only sort of small differences, but still, um, they're in the same family, but uh, they are uh, different. So let's, I want to now to sort of, I, the title is The Female Hormone Odyssey. So what exactly do I mean by that? So far, I've really been focusing on this central pan panel, the beautiful choreography of the menstrual cycle. But just to sort of walk you through this female hormone odyssey and then look at some aspects of it in more detail. All um, women will start here um, with all the hormones low. So the FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone, those are released by the pituitary gland, the conductor of the endocrine orchestra. And these um, uh, hormones uh, direct the production of the ovarian hormones. Of course, in men, it's a sort of a similar situation in the sense that FSH and LH go, in this case, to the gonads, the testes, and direct the production of testosterone. But um, so we have FSH and LH are the control hormones, as I call them, pituitary hormones, and then the response hormones from the ovaries are estradiol and progesterone. But you can see in the child, everything is low, nothing's started, nothing's kicked off yet. And then the woman goes through menarche, and hopefully she uh, enters this central panel, which will be during, uh, continue hopefully during her uh, reproductive years. There is the possibility she may regress to this childlike state of low levels of hormones, either uh, hormonal contraception that suppresses ovulation, or there's a rare medical condition, prolactin over, where there's an overproduction of prolactin. Prolactin normally only produced when you're breastfeeding in high levels, uh, which is why breastfeeding women often don't have periods. But 
Um, occasionally the body can get it a little bit wrong. And so a prolactinoma overproduction can suppress the hormones back to childlike levels. And then also there's the situation of FHA, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail, but essentially it's where there's an imbalance uh, in nutrition and training load. So uh, here we are, hopefully the woman's having a regular menstrual cycle with this beautiful fluctuation of hormones. She may take a little diversion up here into pregnancy. Uh, this is a situation of physiological amenorrhea. And in this case, you can see there's very high levels of estradiol and progesterone from the placenta, which suppresses the production of FSH um, and LH from the pituitary. And then eventually, uh, the woman will move into the final phase, I suppose you could say, of her od odyssey, her, her journey through these hormone fluctuations and uh, go through perimenopause and menopause. Menopause is when the ovaries retire and therefore there are low levels of estrogen and progesterone. However, the pituitary gland effectively is rather cross and sends out very high signals of FSH and LH. So those are the characteristic hormone uh, signatures uh, for the various stages of the female hormone odyssey. So... I want to sort of take it right back now to what happens, what's happening even before the female um, uh, baby is born. Actually, it's really, really fascinating. Um, when the child is in her mother's uterus, there's epigenetic fine tuning uh, of the endocrine system. So epigenetic, so we all know genes, uh, DNA, but epigenetic means the little tags put on the DNA. Um, and so although the a genetic code is not actually altered, the expression of it will be. And this is actually occurring, being fine-tuned um, already when the baby's in utero. Fascinating. Um, uh, and also, this is the time, by the way, when the female fetus, her eggs are already being prepared for when she's born. Um, so yeah, nature is definitely on the front foot in that, in that sense. So what's the purpose of this prenatal programming? Well, actually, it's the way of preparing the child for the outside world. And if uh, what um, if the if it's been predicted what the outside world will look like, then there's an environmental match and it's all fine. But the problem is that some of these epigenetic tags are passed on from generation to generation. So, for example, during times uh, of starvation, then the epigenetic uh, tags of having a thrifty uh, genotype will be um, passed on to the child and then the child is born and actually it doesn't match up. Uh, actually, there's an environmental mismatch. There's lots of fast food around and there's lots of cars to drive you everywhere. So actually, this is already the baby's um, endocrine uh, sensitivity, I suppose you could say, or uh, endocrine phenotype is being determined in utero. And if there's a mismatch or when the child is born, then that's where there's a problem. And I think this, to some extent, explains some of the obesity epidemic we are seeing um, at the moment. Um, uh, and moving on to this, uh, as I said, we're seeing this uh, a big increase in, in obesity. Um, and so what controls eating behaviors? It's under endocrine control. Uh, to a large extent, there are two opposing hormones, I suppose you could say. There's ghrelin, the hungry hormone secreted by the stomach. Uh, and then there's the satiety hormone secreted by adipose tissue called leptin. And so these two have this balance, this sort of push-pull effect. Uh, there's also some neuropeptides um, involved. And this um, directs our eating behavior. So it's not just, uh, you know, you feel hungry or you feel full whether you eat, but of course it's the quality of food, like I've already mentioned. Um, we know that ultra-processed food um, is, is not great. Basically the goodness or nutrition is taken out of it. Additives are put in to give it a long shelf life. So that's a problem. But also it's a problem of timing um, because all these hormones have their own internal biological clocks, biochronometers, as we say. We've already seen an example of an amazing biochronometer in hormone terms of the menstrual cycle has this, this uh, fine tuning, this timing of when the hormones are released. But also there are many other uh, patterns of hormone release. I've already shown you the female odyssey, how the hormones change over the life. So there are these internal clocks running, uh, especially with regard to hormones, 
And really, uh, the challenge is to try and match those clocks running. And if there's a, a mismatch between our behaviors and our internal clocks, this is what's called circadian misalignment. So, for example, um, if and it's sort of a vicious circle. If a young child isn't um, being that active, um, maybe eating fast food, uh, is tempted to you know play computer games late at night, goes to bed late, uh, sleep is the chief nourisher in life's great feast. It's when lots of the hormones are released. Um, then there's going to already starting to be a mismatch, circadian misalignment. Even starting in childhood, recent studies show that this, unfortunately and sadly is transmitted in terms of adult health. So especially adverse effects on um, cardiometabolic health, for example, metabolic syndrome, uh, insulin resistance, high blood pressure, um, tendency to develop therefore uh, type two diabetes and uh, adverse effects on cardiovascular health. So already um, the hormones, the hormone systems not only being fine-tuned, um, uh, when the baby is in utero, but actually as a youngster, really important uh, to try and instill good behaviors and timings of these behaviors, especially eating uh, for, for the youngster. Uh, because what you want to see is this central, this person in the center where the energy intake covers the energy demand from exercise, from training. And then this is called energy availability. This is sufficient to maintain all the healthy processes, biological processes, physiological processes, and including hormone function in the body. But you can see if either um, the person is not exercising enough, like Hippocrates said, they're not taking sufficient exercise, then you can have an excess in energy availability. Um, and conversely, if you just eat a lot, a surplus to your requirement, you're going to have excess energy availability. And this um, has an adverse effect on hormones either way. So here we want to have uh, energy intake matching demand. Uh, but anything, for example, if the surplus energy or indeed energy deficiency, which we will move on to in a moment, that is going to disrupt endocrine function. So looking on the other side of the coin, what about teenagers? So hopefully as a child, the female child, um, you know, is, uh, as Hippocrates suggested, uh, taking sufficient um, nourishment and exercise to support uh, healthy hormones and therefore health overall. But I see a lot of uh, teenagers are under uh, increasing demands, uh, energy demands, because for growth and, and development, and the kicking off the hormones of the reproductive axis, but also they're very busy, which is great, by the way. Um, they're often doing a lot of uh, training and exercise in school, out of school, and they need, of course, powering the brain. 20% of our energy intake is required to uh, uh, fuel our brain. So in their case, we could end up with the opposite, uh, not energy surplus, but actually uh, energy deficit. So this is a similar diagram to what I've shown you before, but showing you the other side of the coin, as it were. You can see here, the individual is uh, consuming sufficient energy to cover the energy demand from exercise and the energy availability that's left over, roughly equivalent to re resting metabolic rate, even lying in bed all day, you need quite a lot of energy to keep you ticking over healthy. Whereas this individual over here is this type of teenager uh, I'm describing where there's a lot of activity a lot of exercise, which on the one hand, you would think, oh, that's great. But if it's not matched with sufficient energy intake, can lead the individual in a situation of what's called low energy availability. There is also the situation of intentional low energy availability. With pressure from social media, et cetera, et cetera, the individual feels obliged to maybe conform to, especially women, to a certain way of looking or eating. And so intentional restriction not necessarily an eating disorder, but disordered eating uh, will, uh, the net result could be low energy availability. And this is a concern, especially for these teenagers because of bone health. There's this paradoxical effect of exercise on bone health. On the other hand, we know that doing weight bearing exercise has a positive osteogenic effect on bones, makes them stronger. But on the other hand, low energy availability has a more powerful effect, especially in these youngsters um, and it is site specific, especially the trabecular rich bone of the lumbar spine suffers. This is a study um, I uh, did uh, referencing, uh, I did with young dancers in training. Uh, and also it has the clinical consequences that 
uh, the individual be more at risk of developing bone stress injuries. Also, the structure of the bone, the microarchitecture, um, can be adversely affected, especially in these youngsters. And this is why. This graph shows you age along the bottom, bone mineral density up the side. You can see in green, I'm showing you that there's a big increase in bone mineral density corresponding to the, the explosion of the reproductive hormones during puberty, the age of at the start of periods, manichae. Peak, so peak bone mass is attained, then the bone health remains relatively stable, and then it is just decline with age, especially at menopause. But if you start off uh, on a bad foot, as it were, uh, and you're in a situation of low energy availability as a teenager, because you're rushing and dashing around doing all these things, maybe influenced by social media pressure, then you're going to be at far higher risk of developing a fractures. And on that note, moving on to the reproductive years, um, to emphasize throughout life, um, navigating the female hormone odyssey and harnessing hormones, it's essential that we look to our exercise, our nutritional intake and recovery uh, for both health and performance. Uh, but uh, in uh, women, it was noticed, originally described as what's called the female athlete triad. Those um, individuals, these were actually collegiate athletes from this study by Barbara Drinkwater um, back in the 1980s. She found those uh, collegiate runners at uh, university college um, had a very, who had a very high mileage, maybe not fueling sufficiently, were more likely to have amenorrhea, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, and problems with bone health. And so it was first recognized that actually and indicated what, as Hippocrates said, if you don't get the balance right, there will be a problem. Since then, we've expanded um, this concept of the female athlete triad and low, the consequences of low energy availability to include men as well, but also to highlight that there are many other systems that will be adversely affected. This is called REDS, Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport, first described um, by the IOC in its consensus statement published in the BJSIM in 2014. There was then an update in 2018 and most recently 2023. Now, you may be thinking, well, surely this is only a problem of elite athletes, but I am seeing, and I would argue, and maybe you've also seen this occurring in keen amateur athletes and dancers, but also just the sort of recreational uh, athletes. I have many who come, women come and apologize. I'm not an athlete yet. They are training, are doing a lot of exercise and they're not fueling sufficiently. And so this has an adverse effect on uh, the hormone networks and all aspects of health and crucially on performance, which the female athlete triad uh, does not mention. Why might someone end up in this situation of intentional low energy availability? Um, that seems not a good choice. And these individuals, um, when you ask them, you will find that they have many of these characteristics. Um, certainly, uh, the dancers and athletes that I work with, they are undoubtedly have drive, perfectionist traits, commitment, self-motivation, um, which are great characteristics. And if you use these in a flexible way around your exercise and your fueling, then indeed you will achieve uh, great things. Uh, you will harness your hormones for the good and optimize your performance. However, if you use these characteristics in a very inflexible, rigid way, and you these flow over into a very rigid uh, approach to training and nutrition, this can lead to a situation of low energy availability, relative energy deficiency, and you can see uh, you need these hormones to drive positive adaptation. So the individual in the long term will not be so healthy. What's happening at the nitty gritty level? Um, so I'll just talk you through this. And this is this gives you an illustration of how uh, fascinating hormones are, how fine, how the hormones adapt to what you do and the interconnection between them. So low energy availability, there will be low levels of leptin. Uh, that I mentioned already. There could also be other external stressors. This will be picked up by the hypothalamus, the neuroendocrine gatekeeper of the whole endocrine axis. The hypothalamus will realize the body is in a, in a stressful situation with low energy availability. It will direct the pituitary gland, the, the conductor of the endocrine orchestra, to save energy and downregulate um, hormone networks, hormone function. The reproductive axis I've shown here, 
uh, is probably one of the first ones to be affected in, in women and in men, by the way. And estradiol is the queen hormone for bone health, as we've mentioned. So a bone health could suffer as a consequence. Also, interestingly, notice, and this is a very clever adaptation, by the way, a metabolic rate will be downregulated. The thyroid axis, there will be low numbers, lower range numbers you will see on a blood test. And this is in order to save energy. The one endocrine system that gets upregulated is cortisol, the stress response hormone. So that's what's happening inside the body in terms of hormone adaptation. And if you maintain this situation of low energy availability, gradually, gradually, all the endocrine systems that I've indicated here with cumulative low energy availability will start to downregulate and shut down. So we all get the nutrition wrong from time to time. Um, you know, if you're in a busy clinic and you intend to have your lunch at one o'clock, but then the clinic doesn't end till three, then of course, I, you know, I will be in energy deficit for a few hours. But that's okay. Mistakes happen from time to time. But if intentionally, especially day after day, week after week, one month after month, the, the woman is restricting what she's eating, uh, then actually um, you can see uh, that uh, all the hormone networks will be downregulated. Uh, and this is the graph I show to many of the athletes and dancers I work with. I say, if you are healthy and you're fueling sufficiently, you will improve your performance with training, of course. But if you're not fueling yourself correctly, then remember relative energy deficiency not only has an adverse effect on health, but also on performance. You will never reach your full potential. What to look out for, particularly in this situation that I'm talking about, um, you will see it. <laughs> not just in elite athletes. Um, so obviously taking a full clinical history and asking about eating patterns and exercise dependence, this very rigid approach to exercise. Um, these are very good indicators and give you little clues as to what might be going on. Other things to look out for, arrested growth and development. So the, the young uh, female might not be having a uh, very slow uh, pubertal development and delayed start of menstruation, um, indeed primary amenorrhea, or menstrual function in the sense that secondary amenorrhea, even if the periods the start of their stop. Um, I know we're talking about uh, women, but just to mention that actually, of course, it's the same adaptive mechanism that occur in, in men as well. Bone stress injuries, obviously, like I've explained, uh, low levels of female hormones, in particular estradiol, will predispose towards bone stress injuries. And also just general mood and change um, and sleep patterns. Interestingly, I've had um, I had one athlete who said, oh, yes, I got really disturbed sleep. I kept waking, waking up. I had this dream about eating a pizza. So the body's making you wake up to go and seek food. Body weight is interesting. Although there might be an initial loss in body weight, it might then be steady. And this is because, remember, there's a down regulation of metabolic rate uh, of the thyroid axis to compensate. The... By the way, the things with stars, these are primary indicators um, as per the new updated IOC consensus statement. And so in, in terms of what would you do to, to come, uh, come to the diagnosis of REDS, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So of course you have to exclude other medical things. And this is um, the sort of list of shopping list of blood tests that I would do. And some of them are particularly recommended by the IOC in order to risk stratify uh, the individual what's what's going on. I've also already mentioned the reproductive axis and thyroid axis, really helpful, especially T3. I know it's really tricky to get that, um, I think in New Zealand as well as the UK, but if you can get T3 measured, that's actually a really good uh, surrogate indicator of energy availability rather than they having to go through the whole rigmarole of diet diaries and estimated energy expenditure, which is notoriously um, inaccurate. So what, this is about the female hormone odyssey. So I really want to talk a little bit about amenorrhea, just to stress and remind you that amenorrhea is a clinical sign. It just says the woman is reporting no periods. It's not a diagnosis. You can't say what, why the eye, what is the cause of the amenorrhea? You have to work through that process. After all, there could be physiological reasons for amenorrhea, such as pregnancy and menopause, I've mentioned. But what you're, if that's not the case, then you're looking for uh, where is the cause? Where's the problem? Is it at the control center? Is it the hypothalamus? Or is it an ovarian issue? 
In the case of the hypothalamus, I mentioned that there is a rare-ish medical condition called prolactinova, overproduction of prolactin, which is why you must always measure that in every woman that's amenorrheic. There could be a medication reason on hormonal contraception, or it could be functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. So this imbalance in nutrition and exercise. It could equally be an ovarian cause. We know, for example, that PCOS, um, interesting, this might have be something to do with epigenetic tagging and uh, the, the, th the thrifty uh, genotype. Um, it could be something with PCOS, uh, PCOS where there's a mistiming of the hormones, or it could be if the FSH and LH are very raised, it could suggest primary ovarian insufficiency. But the really important practical point is that all causes of amenorrhea, apart from pregnancy and PCOS, will be associated with low ovarian hormones. And we've already stressed how important ovarian hormones are for a woman's health and performance. So this is the flow diagram that I use for getting to the bottom of why a woman is presented with amenorrhea. Obviously, one must exclude pregnancy. And thereafter, it's the, uh, the cause is indicated by the levels of FSH and LH as per the WHO criteria. If they're very high, that's indicating an ovarian issue. If they're in the normal range, maybe ALH is even a little bit high uh, and the testosterone is high, of course, you're sort of going more down the PCOS track. If uh, the FSH and LH are low, you must look at prolactin next to exclude the prolactinoma. And there's no overt primary thyroid problem. And then, and only then, can you come to the conclusion this is FHA. Um, so it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So what's the latest um, on REDS? Um, incidentally, why are we seeing an explosion in reds um, among, not just among elite, but actually amateurs? Because I think that, uh, you know, in general, we want to perform better than we did. And this is an example. This is actually within my family. For example, in dance, this is my grandmother uh, in her early 20s. You can see, um, compared to me at about the same age, two generations later, there is just in our family, a big difference in the demands of dancing and the type of uh, costume we're wearing, tighter fitting, etc. So, you know, I think this is that's in dance in, a, in our family, but a, across the board, I think. Uh, and it's good, great. We want to push those boundaries, but uh, we have to be aware that this has to be matched with the change in our behaviours. Um, and that if uh, the person might end up in low energy availability and the adverse consequences of that, if Particularly, I've been talking about low energy availability, but I want to stress that it's really carbohydrate availability. Uh, complex carbohydrate is the main substrate when you're doing intense exercise. Uh, there's this interplay between uh, mental health, the psychological drivers maybe of ending up in reds. And also once you're in that situation of low energy availability, remember the brain takes 20% of your energy intake. So you can't actually, if you're in low energy availability, can't make good decisions. So that's why there's this interplay with mental health and reds. And also there's a change I want to highlight um, about what do you do with a woman who has FHA uh, due to low energy availability? What are you going, and you're worried about her bone health, what are you going to do? And I'm very proud that in the UK, uh, I've wrote to NICE and the guidelines there are changed from two years ago. And what we do is we do not give the combined contraceptive pill for this reason. Uh, the combined contraceptive pill and other forms of hormonal contraception that suppress ovulation, as the name suggests, do precisely that. They suppress ovulation. They suppress all the production of internal hormones. And so the contraceptive pill does not regulate periods. It stops periods. So I think that's uh, important to emphasize that. Um, just I'm just having a quick look at the time. Um, so last couple of slides, um, just to round up on this particular topic, which as you can tell is uh, one of my <laughs> areas of interest and in research. Um, I'm at the moment looking at the situation of subclinical ovulatory disturbance. There's the tip of the iceberg where the person doesn't have any periods at all, amenorrhea, but underneath there could be those that are reporting having periods, but maybe they don't have a robust uh, menstrual cycle and the levels of progesterone are low. And I'm seeing if this can be detected using uh, basal body temperature. So there is this spectrum of adaptation of the female reproductive system according to um, exercise uh, well, behaviors, exercise, nutrition, and sleep, precisely as uh, Hippocrates predicted, by the way. Um, so last few slides um, on the important topic um, of menopause and this particular 
uh, phase in a woman's female hormone odyssey. Uh, menopause, really important with increased life expectancy. Women can be expected to spend at least a third of their life in the menopause status. And the reduction of these ovarian hormones, I've already described how important they are for health, there therefore is the risk for the woman of being at uh, um, increased risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis. So this is what happens. Um, we have the beautiful choreography, the, the menstrual cycle, and then this is what the hormones look at like at menopause. But um, of course, it's not just um, this on off switch. There's the intermediate bit of perimenopause where there's a fluctuation in the hormones, the ovaries that are effectively going part time. This can be really confusing uh, for a woman because some menstrual cycles will be absolutely fine like she's used to, but others, um, there might not be ovulation, there might be low levels of progesterone, um, and therefore early on, relatively speaking, actually higher levels of uh, estrogen compared to progesterone. Then, of course, later on, and the menstrual cycle length will become shorter. And then as she progresses through perimenopause, through the female hormone odyssey, the, the ovaries start to wind down entirely, as you can see there. So that's what's happening. But also, uh, this is on the background of an, a decline in anabolic hormones in general, not only estradiol, which is anabolic for bone and muscle, but also growth hormone in the background is declining. And by the way, this is just to uh, this decline in testosterone this is for men and this is just to show you the contrast although men of course there is a slight decline in production of testosterone from the age of 50 it's not as dramatic definitely as the decline in uh, the female hormone uh, ovarian hormones so what to do about this um, this decline in female hormones at menopause can mean that you are at there is a tendency to lose lean body mass especially muscle and bone uh, and a change in body composition in terms of fat deposition. But fortunately, if we remember Hippocrates, we can modify, and we should indeed, modify our lifestyle choices at this phase in our female hormone odyssey to try and mitigate these the, the effect of the decline in these hormones. So to maintain muscle, good evidence to show that increasing the amount of strength training uh, that you do is important, uh, together with increased protein intake to resist sarcopenia, and good quality sleep as far as you can. Um, to avoid the deposition of visceral fat in particular, again, it's exercise. It is eating some carbohydrates, so you can do good intense exercise and sleep. And for bone strength, uh, same as above, uh, the exercise and sleep, but the vitamin D becomes a particularly important uh, aspect. And I think over there in New Zealand, like in the UK, um, I was there when you had your lovely summer, but I know you guys are now moving into your winter um, and certainly uh, you it's similar sunlight uh, here in the UK. And so you cannot get sufficient vitamin D from diet alone. So vitamin D supplementation is really, really important. Um, what about the thorny question of HRT? Uh, of course, the first port of call is always the lifestyle uh, to harness hormones, but HRT can be uh, useful and should, and I think should be discussed with women to give them uh, that option and so they can make an informed choice. And the priority is for quality of life. It's true there is a slight increase in the risk of breast cancer cases, up to four extra cases per 1,000 women, but this is the same as taking the contraceptive pill and compares to a whopping extra 24 cases where um, lifestyle factors aren't so good in terms of being overweight, not exercising. So I think definitely it's important we have this conversation and put it in the context of um, helping the woman to get the most out of her life and navigate the, this particular phase of her female hormone odyssey. So just rounding up now, um, last few minutes. Yes, I'm on time. Great. Um, so we have taken a bit of a whistle top stop tour through the female hormone odyssey for a woman starting here, uh, low levels of all the hormones uh, when she's a child. Uh, the menstrual cycle, the beautiful choreography there, and maybe some challenges there. Pregnancy, we, we haven't had time to cover today, but that's obviously could be part could be part of the female hormone odyssey. And then every woman will experience perimenopause at some point during her life. So uh, important. We just uh, that's why we discuss that as an important thing. So I leave with a few final uh, comments uh, to remind you that Horme is the goddess of effort, energy, and action, and also this wonderful quote. Uh, as you can see here from the Vice President of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, that we need to treat women, women as individuals, not statistics, because her hormones are very personal and individual to her. 
in what the exact timing and her personal biological response. So we, uh, you know, generic approaches don't always work. Um, and to remind you also that uh, hopefully one of the key messages from today is that uh, the good news is we can all harness our hormones throughout our odyssey uh, through considering and modifying uh, as appropriate our uh, choice of behaviours. And so I hope you don't mind a shameless plug for my book, uh, which uh, covers these topics in more detail. I believe it is available on uh, Amazon in Australia. Um, and then I have got, uh, I think, quite a few references for those that uh, are keen. So thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to uh, getting to grips with your questions. So Nikki, starting off with um, a question around the epigenetic interactions with hormones between the mother and the unborn fetus. Mm. Um, the question here is around, does any hormonal treatment during IVF have effects on the endocrine system of the children born through IVF? Fantastic question. And you know what I'm going to say? We don't know. <laughs> because <laughs> um, uh, I think it's a really important question. But the reason it's difficult to answer that is because although there is a protocol for IVF, right, there will be differences, guess what, between each woman Mm -hmm. uh, into why was she having IVF in the first place? I mean, obviously, because she couldn't conceive, but what was the underlying reason, if you sort mm -hmm. of mean, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was it FHA, which actually is sort of straightforward, as I understand it, in terms of fertility treatment? Was it PCOS? Was it, um, you know, the age? Or was it something to do with the partner's sperm, by the way? You see, so it depend why you're doing IVF in the first place, because that could have a bearing. All right, especially if the woman is having IVF for PCOS already, she's got some epigenetic tags herself, you see, right? So it depends on the woman, why is she having it? And also, although there is a set protocol for IVF, you know, this, you give this injection, that injection, whatever, actually there will be some variations on the theme for that woman. Uh, and, you know, she might have to go through many cycles of IVF, you see. So you see what I mean? There's, uh, unfortunately, the, as far as I understand it, it's not my particular area of expertise, but as far as I can understand it, just looking at it logically, there are going to be so many variables and confounding factors, it will be difficult to tease that out. So um, I'm sorry, that's the absolute answer, but I think it's a really important one. And hopefully um, I'll have a word with my colleague at UCL uh, <laughs> who works in this field. And definitely we need some studies to know exactly uh, what, if there, if there are any uh, uh, long-term effects, but also the IVF is for triggering ovulation effectively and implantation. So actually, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's during the early development of the fetus, it's during those first 12 weeks, as you know, when all the organs are being developed, et cetera. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the treatment to just get the egg to ovulate isn't going to be so influential because I'm talking about more epigenetic during the pregnancy itself is the other side to it. So. Um, sorry, I, so there's lots of, it's complicated, can I say, but, uh, but that's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nikki. So we've got a couple of questions around intermittent fasting. Um, uh -oh. Does intermittent fasting affect, um, affect hormonal health, um, including bone density? Um, yes, probably. Um, there is a study from, again, from Anna Mellon and her excellent research team in Denmark showing that having mini energy deficits during the day which would occur obviously with intermittent fasting, there's an adverse effect on hormones, i.e. increase in cortisol, decrease in testosterone in men and decrease in estrogen in women. And so, you know, estrogen we know is important for bone health and also cortisol has the opposite effect. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone, breaks stuff down. So actually, um, yeah, you'll be more likely to, I would imagine in the long term, if you, to be at risk of, possibly poorer bone health and actually body composition because cortisol drives the deposition of fat, you see, because it's a, a, an emergency situation, storage. So um, I, as I understand it from that evidence, uh, then yeah, potentially it's basically an energy deficit. Intermittent fasting is just causing an energy deficit. Uh, I mean, to be fair, the, uh, the obesity epidemic, like we mentioned, Sometimes you do need a little bit of an energy deficit if you do need to be a healthy weight. So intermittent fasting is no different from any diet where you reduce your portion size, but I would suggest that's a better way of doing it, right? Just reduce the portion size as all the meals, you see, and, and keep a good timing of the meals to synchronize with your internal hormone biochronometers. So um, 
Uh, but on the other hand, if that actually you shouldn't be reducing your energy intake because you're you're in a good situation, like in you don't want to avoid reds, then it probably will have an adverse effect in the long term uh, on your bone health. And and there's some comments and questions around intermittent fasting and the perimenopause, and including for weight management. I guess you've already covered some of that. Might not be so good yes. in the long term. Yes, exactly. I think, listen, we all want a quick fix, don't we? And I understand it. When you're going through perimenopause and menopause, you get, do get frustrated. It's like, hold on, um, I'm doing the same things. Why is, I'm not getting the same results? Why has my body composition changed? Why has my weight increased? Don't get it. You get frustrated. But actually, if you think about it, of course, things, things you have to change what you're doing because your hormones have changed. So the, the reflex reaction might be, okay, restrict intermittent fasting. I don't mind. All it... Intermittent fasting, restricting your calorie intake is the same deal, right? But if you restrict what you're eating, actually, you're going to upset your, uh, you know, your thyroid axis, the thyroid axis, you see. And so actually, then it's, it's, um, how can I say, counterproductive, you are downregulate your metabolic rate, right? And so you'll find it even harder to lose, to lose weight or control weight. So the answer is, yes, you do need to modify what you're eating, look at your portion size, don't cut out carbohydrates, but look at the portion size, increase your protein, right? You need that for muscles, make you feel fuller, um, you know, do your strength exercise. It's all those lifestyle things which do take time to work. And as I say, we're in a society and I understand it. I'm the same. Limited time. We just want a quick fix. But unffortunately, the quick fixes um, are too good to be true often. <laughs> so they I backfire. Lose so now. I just, yeah, yeah, exactly. I get it. I get it. But just stick to those fundamental principles and I think that that's going to serve better in the long term yeah we've got a number of questions around hormonal contraception oh yeah what are your thoughts um Nikki around the continuous regime of taking the combined oral contraceptive pill um mm -hmm. in terms of hormonal health for women well I mean I don't think it really makes any difference the fundamental thing about combined contraceptive pill and some types of progesterone only contraception are that they suppress ovulation, whether you take continuously or not. The only reason that the combined contraceptive pill has this break and uh, gives uh, producers a withdrawal bleed was frankly from a psychological point of view. It's, a bit, it's literally to fool the woman that she thinks she's having a period, right? So, you know, um, it doesn't really prove anything. You know, it's, it's not a really, it's not a barometer of internal healthy hormone. It's a, just a barometer that you've taken a break from your contraception. You see what I mean? So mm. I don't have a strong view about continuous or whatever, right, um, in that sense. Um, but I think the fundamental question is, you know, uh, are we giving the best advice to women? Uh, of course, it's every woman's absolute right to choose what form of contraception she chooses to take. And I'm not you know, uh, debating that. But what I am saying is, how can she possibly choose which might be best for her or whether she wants to take it after all if she doesn't really understand what it does? You see, so mm -hmm. explaining that the combined contraceptive pill can be really, really useful for women switching off their hormones if they're really suffering with endometriosis, which is driven by female hormones, for example, right? Uh, and, and having it taken in a continuous way in that sense, she won't get any withdrawal bleeding and actually hopefully the symptoms will be much better. So that's great. But on the other hand, if the woman thinks that she hasn't got regular menstruation and thinks that this, uh, this, these withdrawal bleeds are periods and has fixed the problem, that's not correct. You see what I mean? So I think actually probably I would suggest we need to go even a step back further from that and saying, what, why does the woman and what are her reasons and what's the best choice for her in the first place? And then we can go on to the finer detail of which one, what regime, all that sort of thing. There's a question around various types of hormonal contraception, the combined pill, the progesterone only pill, the myrena, and the effect that that might have on athletic performance. Would that reduce that, reduce athletic performance at all, mm. Nikki? It's one of these uh, questions like uh, the, uh, the original question, or it, we started with, does the phase of the menstrual cycle, does the menstrual, you know, affect your performance, athletic performance, right? And everyone was debating this. And there was a big um, analysis of all the data and the conclusion came out, no, no, it doesn't affect it. But this is the problem with meta-analysis, by the way, that if you put a whole load of various studies in, various measurements of timings of the menstrual cycle, which is complicated and individual, like I've already said, guess what answer you're going to get out? Average, null. 
But we know as an individual, there are, will be women who it definitely does affect, even if it's even if it's not a, at, uh, at a psychological level. So the menstrual cycle in itself is an individual thing. Does that affect performance? Therefore, we can no way predict what will happen if you take contraception to suppress those hormones. Do you see what I mean? Um, mm. I my instinct tells me that surely estrogen is an anab- is um, you know an anabolic hormone. So taking um, hormonal contraception that suppresses the production of that, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem to add up. And certainly, as I say, it's contraindicated in terms of it doesn't provide bone protection full stop in FHA. We we know that, you see. But on the other hand, it depends. If the woman was really suffering with endometriosis and couldn't perform because of her pain, now she takes the contraceptive pill, she will perform better. So I'm, I'm sorry, I go back to the original thing that we need to treat women as individuals i can't give a blanket statement and say this will help or hinder women we don't know because it depends on the individual what's her mental cycle like um and you know what's her reason for taking the contraception so we can't give a, a a blanket answer we had the same debate about acl injury we've had explosion of acl injuries in female footballers in the uk and the whole thing initially, oh, yes, it's uh, the ramping up of estradiol before ovulation. That is why women are getting ACL injuries, uh, some studies said. And then others said no. But then I was just like, well, of course we don't know. Because when are you measuring this? Well, what is this timing? You'll say every woman has this exact time now when the estrogen goes up. We don't even know if it goes up. Is it at that time? So it's a little bit of a murky area. So I go back to treat women as individuals. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was a bit of a no, rant, no. wasn't it? <laughs> There's a question around uh, athletic training, I guess sports training, timing it with the menstrual cycle. Is there any kind of recommendation about when training might be better, when it might be avoided? Same, same answer. But so in theory, in theory, I stress in theory, if the woman is ovulating, uh, and she has that ramping up of estrogen uh, in the late follicular phase. Theoretically, estrogen, I've told you, is an anabolic hormone and the woman might be feeling really good, right? And so this is a time to really, you know, uh, train intensely, uh, et cetera. Um, that's the theory of it. And But as I said, that's really murky because the timing, question mark, individual biological response, question mark. We don't know. Some women, it's true. That is, that is absolutely true. But there are other women, including a professional female cyclist here in the UK, who said that she had read all this stuff and the menstrual monitoring apps has told her you should be feeling amazing now. But she felt dreadful every single time. It's like, no, I feel I don't feel good here. And she literally thought there was something wrong with her. But actually, there was nothing wrong with her. It was just her own personal biological response to estrogen. No, she didn't feel so good pre-ovulation, but she felt better, actually, strangely, you could say, in the luteal phase. So uh, it's really down to the individual. Um, but theoretically, that might be a good time to, you know, increase the training intensity. Uh, whereas the luteal phase, I think we can be a little bit more certain with that, maybe, that the luteal phase, if the woman has ovulated and she hasn't got subclinical ovulatory disturbance, another big if, by the way, and the progesterone is high, we know the effect of progesterone is to increase metabolic rate. So the woman will feel more hungry. She does need to eat a little bit more. She will literally feel hot and bothered because of the increase in metabolic rate. So theoretically, that could maybe, um, you know, you might need more recovery and whatever during that phase of the cycle. But again, that is assuming that you have ovulated, that you have got a robust luteal phase. So you see what I mean? There's lots of ifs and buts. So my uh, general, my recommendation is all women, please do monitor your menstrual cycle. Don't necessarily... I'm very old. We didn't have apps and things in our day. Pen and pencil is fine. And actually, then you can almost make your own report of how do you feel during the cycle. Make your own log of how you feel and then direct your training according to how you feel. But also, there's the other extra complication. If you're training with a team, you can't say, right, uh, as an individual, you can't say, right, I'm in this phase of my menstrual, I'm doing this. So also the practical constraints and you need to speak to your coach. So there probably is some effect of the menstrual cycle for some individuals um, on how the performance, but I don't, it would be absolutely disturb women to make generalizations because then like this, this cyclist, you might start to think something's wrong with you if you don't fit this theoretical mold. Now there's some questions around T3 that you mentioned, Nikki. Mm -hmm. um, could you comment a bit more about its significance, especially around um, 
some clarification around measuring the energy availability. Uh, some excellent work by Anna Mellon and actually Anna Lukes from many years ago, seminal work there um, showing that um, low energy availability is got a really tight correlation with T3, right? That's why it's one of the primary indicators uh, from the new updated IOC consensus statement, okay? So TSH causes the thyroid to secrete T4, um, also some T3, and also this peripheral conversion of T4 to T3, right? So that's the, the gist of it. T3 is very active, and, it's, and as I say, from all this research, we know that that is uh, closely tied with energy availability. So that's why it's a really excellent uh, surrogate um, indicator. But I know um, that certainly here in the NHS, uh, yeah, we can get TSH. We diagnose primary overall underactive thyroid on TSH, don't we? So, you know, that's generally what we're dealing with. We tell you TSH they'll do and sometimes T4 if you're lucky, but it is really tricky to get T3. And kind of I understand it. Certainly here in the NHS, you know, we're dealing, although it's health, actually we're dealing sort of primarily with sickness and, 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 and uh, medical conditions. So T3 does seem a little bit of a peripheral thing. But for the athlete that you suspect of REDS, um, actually T3 is one of those primary indicators for that reason. It's a really good indicator of energy availability and fine tuned. And I will see if I'm working with an athlete who starts off in low energy availability with low T3 and I encourage them to eat carbohydrates and get a better you know, training schedule, et cetera, the T3 goes up quite quickly, right? And it will come to a more healthy range, right? Not uh, rather than the no range. Whereas the T4, there's a bit of a lag in that because it is a, uh, has got a longer uh, half-life. So that's the story behind T3. Now with vitamin D, uh, Nikki, mm -hmm. apparently there's some recent data that shows it it's, uh, doesn't necessarily support bone health. Could you comment on that? I'm not aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, vitamin D, we know it's important for bone health. Um, we know that it's important for um, recover, muscle recovery, especially eccentric loading of muscle. And we know it's important for immunity. So... Um, I mean, we, we know this because, you know, uh, old people living in, in nursing homes who don't see much sun and maybe their diet isn't so great. Um, they have low uh, vitamin D and poor bone health. I agree that it's, there's sometimes lack of activity as well, but it's certainly one of those contributing factors. You know, bone health, there's so many factors, estrogen levels, activity levels. Uh, vitamin D is actually a steroid hormone. So, and it, it has a synergistic effect with estrogen and testosterone. So to my understanding, looking at the research, I think vitamin D and also vitamin D, it's not very expensive supplement. So, you know, why wouldn't you? If, even if, you know, for bone, but for immunity, muscle recovery, and actually well-being. I just saw an athlete the other day living in England and her vitamin D was in her boots and she felt really low mood. And I said, gosh, and she started taking vitamin D, she felt better. So, you know, there's so many benefits from taking vitamin D, such a simple thing to do. Um, lots of people don't realize. So I would say vitamin D every time. It's, uh, it's, a perform it's a legal performance enhancer. Do you have any specific recommendations in terms of dose or brand for vitamin D? Um, brand, no, um, the cheapest. Um, uh, <laughs> that's what I go for. Um, uh, for in terms of dose, obviously, in the ideal world, you would do a blood test to quantify. And by the, I don't know about you in New Zealand, but in my, in our opinion, in the UK, the the range is too big. Um, there's good research to show that 100 nanomoles per liter, the concentration of vitamin D, that's what you're shooting for, and that has a lower incidence of bone stress fractures uh, for athletes, lower incidence of infections over the winter months and better muscle recovery. So that's what you're aiming for. So if possible, get a bit, get a blood test so you can quantify where is the person starting from. Um, but if in doubt, uh, then probably something around a thousand international units a day. That's what I take every day of the year, unless I come to some sunny New Zealand. Um, so at the very least during the winter months. Uh, but as I say, personally, I take it all year round unless I'm going somewhere sunny. Now, um, a lot of our women with PCOS struggle to lose weight mm. um, and sometimes um, might ask around things like weight loss medications to support that. What are your, mm. If you could shed some light on the maybe weight management with PCOS and also the role of medications for that. Yeah, so PCOS, um, you know, I know the recent um, 
uh, what you call it, guidelines, definitions have been updated, but essentially it's uh, what is PCOS. Uh, by the way, it's not cysts even. Anyway, it's multiple follicles. So it's irregular cycles, uh, clinical biochemical evidence of raised testosterone, and on the ultrasound, multiple follicles. So two out of those three things. Um, but also it's got this interesting syndrome thing. It's got this insulin resistance component to it, a bit like di type 2 diabetes, which is why women with PCOS, apart from having irregular periods and maybe struggling to get pregnant, um, also have issues sometimes with weight management. So what to do about that? Guess what? Hippocrates. Uh, so, you know, it's exercise and it is strength exercise because that's really good for boosting, uh, you know, using energy effectively. So look to exercise. What is exercise they're doing? Uh, nutrition, not to cut out carbohydrates entirely, but certainly to be really mindful of the portion size and the quality of the carbohydrate, you know, I'm talking complex carbohydrates, slow release, you know, uh, cereals, uh, pasta, potatoes, bread. So they should still be eating some of those things, but just monitoring the portion size, you see. So I think lifestyle is all, always first, and that could be a really good starting point. Um, then in terms of if there is concerns about blood glucose control, HbA1c raise maybe, or something like this, then, you know, inositol actually, although it's not medication, has been helpful. And also metformin, like type 2 diabetics, uh, has been shown to be helpful for the insulin resistance. Again, we don't understand the mechanism, but it works. <laughs> um, so those would be the key things, lifestyle, and then those forms of medication. It, and then it really depends on what the woman wants to achieve. If she doesn't want to become pregnant, but she's bothered by high levels of testosterone, then actually the contraceptive pill in this situation might be helpful. Won't necessarily help for the weight thing, but her overall well-being, right? Um, but of course, on the other side of the coin, if the woman does want to become pregnant, then actually this might be ovulation induction and whatever. Although controlling the body weight and getting that uh, blood sugar control un uh, improved is a really uh, helpful starting point. With red snicky, um, if our patients needing additional support, where could mm -hmm. what kind of avenues could we refer them? Obviously, this is going to be New Zealand specific, um, different to what's mm -hmm. available in the UK. But is there a role for a dietitian or a psychologist, especially if someone's mm -hmm. say living rurally? Yeah, it's it's really tricky. This one we have the same problem here in the UK because reds. There are many problems. Number one, it's a functional disorder, so it's about behaviours and changing behaviours. We know is very difficult, uh, and also it is, as you say. Uh, sort of presenting with many signs and symptoms so it doesn't really fall into one particular uh, you know oh it's it's a uh, I don't know uh, it's a uh, sports medicine doctor it's an injury you know it's, there's lots of covers and so ideally the solution is in the ideal world when I say multidisciplinary I mean connections so um, for example here in the UK I see dancers and athletes from a medical point of view because it has to be a medical diagnosis in the first place because you've got to exclude other stuff and interpret bloods, blah, blah, blah. But then actually I work very closely with the clinical dietitian, for example, for those where there is a disordered eating, a psychological aspect, because she's very good at, at helping that. And if it's also associated with an injury, I've got a nicer physiotherapist. See what I mean? So you can make up your own little team of connections um, but I agree, I understand, you know, location wise, but nowadays and since um, COVID, uh, actually a lot of it is virtual. And actually I do, even though I live in London, I do a lot of my stuff virtually because, you know, um, coming all the way from Scotland in England, that's a long distance, by the way, <laughs> Scotland to London. It's like, wow, that's far anyway uh, and expensive. Um, so, you know, you can don't be disheartened. I understand the challenges, but I would encourage you to build up your own network of of people in the know from various disciplines like that and because then you can put it all together uh, and also for the co the coach getting the coach involved as well is really helpful because sometimes I'm working with the athlete or dancer and they're like okay fine I, I, I've got this I understand I need to reduce my training intensity but if they haven't communicated with the coach then how are they meant to know they're just going to set them the same training so I suggest that with their permission of course we have a chat so that's how I would approach it and that's what I do in the UK make your own little network um and also in terms of resources of course there's my own website and book but also i wrote the british association of sports and exercise medicine health or performance which is on red so that's another uh resource you can uh look into but i know you guys in new zealand i know of speaking to high performance sports and there are various sports medicine doctors over the country who are in the know if i can put it that way um so you know there are uh 
teams uh, people you can link up with there in terms of someone was asking around any particular supplements that might be recommended in perimenopause that have evidence behind them it's a little bit of a minefield i mean basically vitamin d for sure right um, but there are other supplements, herbal remedies. But the thing is, uh, I'm a member of the British Menopause Society here in the UK and I've done their courses and everything. And so, you know, herbal supplements can be really helpful for some women. But the problem is because they're not like a medication, you make sure you're choosing really good quality, you know what it's got in it, you know, and be aware that it might work or might not. But we can't dis dismiss the positive placebo effect, by the way. And for some women who, for whom HRT is contraindicated, can be really, really helpful. But be aware that some of them aren't this sort of inert thing you think, like St. John's Walk can interfere with metabolism of other medications. So, you know, one has to be a little bit uh, mindful of that. Um, but there's, there is a whole list of them, but I can't recite them all <laughs> uh, now. Uh, but I have got information of that in my book and also... For, uh, maybe you probably have that information as well. The British Menopause Society also, we have kind of like a list of these are the ones that maybe there's some evidence. Uh, but if in doubt, vitamin D um, is helpful. There are new non-hormonal things coming through as well. Um, uh, uh, it's on Kispeptin, I think. Uh, anyway, so there are things in the pipeline coming through. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's down to the individual woman. If she, if she can't take HRT or doesn't want to or whatever, then certainly there are alternatives, but be really, um, discerning in the choice and be aware that they might not work. <laughs> so last question, Nikki, you talked about the three pillars of exercise, sleep and nutrition. If a woman mm -hmm. is having trouble sleeping, especially perimenopause and postmenopausal, is melatonin useful? Mixed results again. Right. Um, you know, when I was doing my flight, some people saying, oh, take melatonin to help with jet lag. I'm not sure. Maybe it's one of those things. Maybe really interesting research coming out of Canada. Professor Geraldine Pryor, um, really amazing work. And she's done a recent study in Canada, big study saying, showing that actually taking micronized progesterone standalone, uh, you know, part of HRT can help not only with temperature regulation, hot flushes, and that, but therefore sleep, because often it's, why is the sleep disturbed? Yes, it's because the hormones are changing, but also often it's the hot flush that is making you wake up, you see? So actually, if you can deal with that, then that might actually help the sleep. But I agree, it's one of those vicious circles. Uh, you know, you, you know that sleep is important, yet it's being disturbed because of almost things out of your control because the hormones are changing. Um, so other than the usual sort of sleep hygiene strategies that we're all aware of, um, you know, there is even the really brutal sleep scheduling where you actually get up when you're, you can't sleep, but look out for this micronized progesterone. I think that's, uh, something on the horizon that might be helpful. And actually we'll really switch around our whole way of thinking about HRT because actually it's initially the progesterone that drops, not the estrogen. Oh, wow. <laughs> Here we uh, go. Exactly. Watch the space. Yeah. You need to speak to, yeah, uh, <laughs> Professor Geraldine Pryor. I'm convinced I can see her research. Yeah. It's like, that looks really, really interesting. Anyway, oh, there you go. Cool. Well, that's our time. Um, thank you so much, Nikki, for joining us. And Nikki's all the way in the UK. So she's got up very early to join us today. Thank you for your wisdom and for answering all of our questions. Um, and yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone.